now, Rhonda. Thank you very much, Colin. And thank you to the library. <laughs> and thank you to all of you for coming. I do see some familiar faces out there, and I'm very glad to see them. One is a big surprise. Um, but I'm, I'm just glad you all came. Whether or not it's from reading my column or just come to the series that the library is holding or whatever it is, it's still nice that you're all here. So welcome. Um, for those of you who maybe don't know that much about me, uh, I do write for those guys from Rapids Tribune, the Stevens Point Journal, and the Marshfield News Herald. And I do the same sort of historical columns in each of those areas. And they're supposed to be in twice a month in each newspaper. And uh, that doesn't always happen dependent upon the other news, but that's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, they're not the same columns, obviously. Stevens Point, Once at Point, Marshfield's from Marshfield area. But one of the books that I think is probably what brought most of you out here tonight, The Wicked Wood County, Wisconsin, actually covers the entire county of, of uh, Wood from the north to the south. And I will tell you a little bit more about that when I get here because there are a couple in interesting um, things that I have discovered through the many years of writing. I've been writing for the Tribune now since I believe 1998, so wow, that's been a while. Um, I've had my column, which is called Rhonda's View Rendezvous, in the Tribune since, I think it's 12 years now. I have been in the Marshfield News Herald for about eight years and in the Stevens Point Journal for about seven years. So I've been doing this for quite a while and I truly enjoy it. Uh, whoever it was that said you should do what you enjoy is abs absolutely right because it's wonderful to have a job where you are just loving every minute of it. And this, um, to see a book published is just kind of a, a perk after all your work <laughs> that you get this besides. When I started out writing, it had, I had no idea it was ever going to publish even my first book, which is Saratoga Sands. This is the history of the little township of Saratoga. For those of you who don't know, it's just south of Rapids and, and runs from kind of a ways, I'm not sure how many miles south of Rapids anymore, but then all the way to the Adams County line and actually stretches quite a ways from the Wisconsin River by the Nakusa Bridge all the way over to, um, I guess, where Grand Rapids starts, which is quite a ways again. But uh, I did this history, first of all, not planning on making any money on the book. I feel that history is very important, whether it's the history of the world, the history of the United States, the history of your family. I'm big into genealogy. All those things are extremely important to me. And nobody had ever done anything on Saratoga, and you think, oh, well, yeah, it was just Saratoga, and who cares? But as I started researching and writing stories, I realized that there was a lot of history in Saratoga. And that's one of the things I wanted to point out about the Wicked Wood County book. I discovered, as I was writing for the, the uh, uh, Marshfield News Herald and the Tribune here in Rapids, that Marshfield being pretty much just a farm town, uh, settled originally by farmers and loggers, that was about it. They didn't have the river that we have, so you didn't have this wild and woolly bunch of crazy men out there, river rafters and whatever, who, it, it was frontier justice, they just kind of did what they wanted to do when they wanted to. And back in the, those days, in the early days of both towns, the police didn't even step in or do much about anything. I mean, if it were a, a murder, like a husband murdered a wife, yes, the police investigated and did something, and maybe he went to jail and maybe he didn't. But when it was just a couple guys fighting in the bar room and one killed the other, the police just said, okay, well, you know, that, that things happen. And so, um, but I discovered that, I don't know if it was because it was farmers and loggers up in, in uh, uh, Northwood County, or what, but even though there were murders up there in the early days, they got worse as you came down. And you can say, well, okay, Wisconsin Rapids, though, at that time, Grand Rapids, and Centralia. You can say, but that was a wild and rowdy town, Nakusa, Port Edwards, those three river cities there. 
But then I discovered that from Wisconsin Rapids south to the Adams County line, the murders that took place were more twisted and demented and thought out, planned and schemed and horrible things happened. It wasn't just getting in a fight and killing somebody or shooting your wife because you were angry at her. These were very devious things. And I thought, okay, well, <laughs> I'm not quite as comfortable living in the town of Saratoga where I was born and raised, but <laughs> this is what it is. And I decided, that's when I decided this book really needed to be uh, written. The first part of it, the very short first part of it, is actually the history of the township itself, explaining where the original little village was and who the first settlers were, were and various things like that. And then from there I go on with stories about people in the area uh, that, that settled in Saratoga and thinking they would stay there forever and some didn't, some didn't. Some of the names mentioned here are still around the area and others came and left. They found it a place they couldn't stay, especially after some of the murder and mayhem that took place. So the purpose of this, like I say, it was strictly historical. I thought, I don't care if I don't make a penny. All I want to do is get this book out there, especially in the hands of genealogists. If anybody purchases this, I apologize for all the typos in it. It was not edited as well as my other books, so it probably still have typos. Anyway, um, I'm sure you can figure out what I mean, even if they do. Uh, I, I was never going to do another publishing of this, but I have had sold a lot in the uh, library readings, and so I think I may go ahead and, and uh, edit it again and then get it to the uh, my daughter, the editor, is going. Uh, and, and she's not to blame for all the typos, don't get me wrong, it's just that that is what she went to college for. <laughs> so I expect to hope on it this next time. <laughs> anyway, uh, that, that's what this book is. Um, I will speak before I do the reading also about this book, A Year Out of My Mind. Um, this was written, the idea for this came about um, as I was with a group of friends, uh, three other friends who are also authors. And we all write different types of things and have different writing styles. but we formed a little exclusivist, if you will, writer's club. And did not want to do, you know, writing assignments and all that nonsense. Basically, we were getting together to say, what are you doing? Here's what I'm doing. And then one day, uh, it's a long story how it evolved, but it came about we kind of did do writing assignments. And this was supposed to be, this year out of my mind, was supposed to be stories through the 12 months of the year by each one of the four of us. So it should have been four times larger. <laughs> However, through the now next like two to three years, for various reasons, um, some of the people just couldn't complete what they were doing. Their lives took turns. They got very busy with other projects, other things, uh, and just did not have the time to devote to this. And so I thought, I wrote them. I'm going to publish them. Through the years, I've had many people ask me why I don't publish something that I have written myself, and I thought, okay, this is my chance. Anyway, so A Year Out of My Mind uh, is also dedicated to the other three in my writer's club. I will say that this is rather dark. Uh, if you like Twilight Zone and um, The Outer Limits and Alfred Hitchcock, you'll like this. If you don't like that kind of don't get this. My um, doctor is here tonight, and I gave her a copy, and she hasn't written out commitment orders yet, but I think that probably she's thought about it more than once. You know, I, yeah, it's like you, I go into her office, and she goes, oh, and you again. No, she doesn't. She's a sweetheart. Anyway, so that's how this came about, and like I say, part of the dedication is to the other members of my writer's club, one of whom is a very dear friend, and I would like him to stand up and take a bow, David Farnborough. And then if you have any questions afterwards, and he probably is familiar, a familiar face to many of you here. If you have any questions as to why he didn't complete, you go talk to him afterwards. Don't ask me. <laughs> anyway, good to see you, David. Um, so, with no further ado, I guess, since you know a little bit of my background, uh, I will read you 
fortunately, these books are all very short stories, and so it does not take long to read one. And I'm going to read you one out of each, uh, at least one out of each, if you want a second out of the Wood County murder book that I will do. Uh, this one in the Saratoga book. One of the things that I'm asked, I, I often speak to, I've spoken to writers clubs, I've spoken to genealogy clubs, and I've spoken about genealogy and about writing at separate times. And one of the questions that I am asked um, about the things that I have written, whether it's my columns or just stories or whatever, is what is your favorite one and which one do you wish you hadn't written? And I can tell you that probably the, my favorite one, true one to have written, is this one called Life After Death, The Rest of the Story. And this actually was also published in the Tribune, but it was many, many years ago. And what I like about it, when I am doing my research, sometimes I find items about the story that I'm writing that are just so fascinating that you never realize we're going to tie in with what you were writing. And such was the case with this one. When I started to write about this little tiny gravestone on this original Saratoga site, I had no idea where I was going to go with my research and the story I was actually going to find. And I found it so fascinating that I think you'll enjoy it too. And that way, you don't have to buy the book. I think this is the best story in there. <laughs> Life after death, the rest of the story. This is the simple story of a solitary grave near a small creek, but yet so much more. It is the story of a man's life touched by war, sorrow, hardship, a cross-country journey, an eerie coincidence, and a documented link to fame, which he would never know about. The 149-year-old stone stands as silent testimony to the life of little George Adrian Ensign, who died April 23, 1860, at the age of three and the early Saratoga settlement just off Highway 13 South. George was the son of John and Lou Perla Rosella Enston, who were born in New York, where they resided until sometime in the mid-1800s, when they headed west, eventually ending up in the southeastern part of Wood County in the just-forming Saratoga settlement. John, a widower with five children when he married Lou Perla, had been a farmer in New York. He found, like the other settlers here, that the sandy soil of Saratoga was not the best for farming, but with the building boom, there was a need for housing materials. According to the Wood County Place Names by Robert Rudolph, John started a pony sawmill on the Ten Mile Creek, also known as Iron Creek, where he made shingles, as well as serving as postmaster of Saratoga. While living here on October 17, 1861, he enlisted as a musician in Company G of the 12th Regiment, Wisconsin Infantry, and went off to war, but was discharged May 28, 1862 for a disability. It was after this, perhaps, unable to continue his occupation here, that he moved to Minnesota. Before that time, though, on October 1, 1856, while the Ensigns lived in Saratoga, little George, who was called by his middle name, Adrian, was born. This is where he lived and where he died, drowning when just a child of three in the Ten Mile Creek. As if not tragic enough on its own, the story of his drowning was another, has another sad twist as well. Even though John had three other sons before George, this was the child he named after his beloved father, his father himself, who himself had drowned in the Hudson River in Saratoga County, New York, when John was just a toddler, not quite two. Now, 42 years later and a thousand miles distant, John would lose his son, George, just as he had lost his father, George, to a drowning in another place also called Saratoga. How hard it must have been for the Anson family to move on and leave their child here alone next to the water that took his life, but move on they did, on to Wabasha, Redwood, and Rice Counties in Minnesota. They eventually would end up in California, where John died in 1900, and Lou Perla in 1913. It is while living in Redwood County, Minnesota, however, that the best documented part of the Ensign family history would transpire, and testament of their family's caring would forever become a part of the American history, of American history, just because of who their friends were. John had a total of ten children, Franklin, Emily, Edwin, Alice, Herschel, George Adrian, Willard, Anna, Carrie, and Howard. 
Besides losing George Adrian while here in Saratoga, Emma and Anna would both die at age 18, and little Carrie died the same year she was born in 1865. Life was harsh then. At the time the Ensigns moved to Redwood County, though, they had three young children still at home, Willard, Anna, and Howard. And those three children became best friends with three little girls, Mary, Laura, and Carrie Ingalls, the very same Ingalls of Little House on the Prairie fame. Although it would not be until the 1930s when Laura Ingalls Wilder would write her stories, decades after John and Lou Perla died, the Ensign family still played an important role in her books, with the author stating that when her family returned to Walnut Grove in the fall of 1877, it was the Ensign family who took them in until Pa Ingalls could build a house. In William Anderson's book, Laura Ingalls Wilder, A Biography, Anderson explains the ages of the children and where they were in their school studies in relationship to each other, as well as the support of each family for the other. The six children became nearly inseparable while Ma Ingalls and Lou Perla raised their children together and helped one another with housework. John Miller, another biographer, goes even a bit further in his book, Becoming Laura Ingalls Wilder, The Woman Behind the Legend when he tells how a very young Howard Ensign proposed to Laura. She took the proposal rather seriously until he got jealous and cried because she played with another boy, so she told him to forget it. She was not interested. <laughs> Although the Ensign's lives were marked by hardship and tragedy, they would never know the total legacy they left. And they would never know the total legacy they left. A part of them remains always in Laura Ingle Wilder's written record of their life in Walnut Grove. Grove and a tiny spot in the woods along the Ten Mile Creek in Saratoga. There's a picture of the stone, and this is actually courtesy of the man who owns the land. Now you can't just walk back there. You have to get his permission, and he took me back to see the gravestones back there. So that's one of the stories in the Saratoga Sands book. I will say I think part of the reason that Saratoga is maybe much more evil than the other part of Wood County, Wisconsin, is because it just lies on the border there of Adams County. <laughs> and I think something comes over the line, whether it's water or air or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I still remember when I asked my brother one time, I, I, this was before I'd written any of this, many years ago, he owned a gun shop here and I had uh, wanted to do a story on Adams County because it was just so evil and horrible things were happening there. I said to him, and Tim wasn't afraid of anyone, and I said, would you come down with me to Adams County while I ask some questions so I can write this book and you'll just kind of be my bodyguard. And he said, are you out of your mind? He said, <laughs> he said even the Wood County deputies, when they have to transfer somebody down there or pick somebody up down there, they do not go alone. Even the deputies went in Paris. He said, no way. If you want to stay alive, don't go asking questions in Adams County. So, <laughs> Anyway, um, the year out of my mind book, as I said, is pure fiction, and some of it is, a couple of things are really dark, um, and the rest are just kind of, nah, different. And when we wrote this, again, as I said, it was supposed to be a month, um, a story for each month, and so I'm going to do April. I would love to do the March one for you, but it doesn't translate for somebody to speak it. You've got to read it so you see the words. Anyway, so I will do April, which is appropriately called The Fool. I had a friend born on Christmas Day who hated it when his birthday arrived. He never had received gifts wrapped in birthday wrap, but rather, rather in Christmas-themed paper. He always felt shorted on Christmas gifts, too, almost as if his parents had split his Christmas gifts and just called some of them birthday. Mine was worse, though. I suppose that anyone who has a birthday on a holiday has some reason to complain, but being born on April 1st was absolutely the worst. I could not really think of one good thing about it because you were always the butt of jokes. You were always called the fool. As a child, I thought it interesting and a bit funny when kids would tease, so I played along. By the time I was a teen, the novelty had worn off, though, and the jibes began to hurt. I was also not very old before I realized that sometimes karma seems to have a real twisted sense of humor. Take the choice of my parents. Karma seemed to have had a big hand in that. They were both deaf mutes. 
the term which was commonly used when they were born, before it was realized that someone hearing impaired could speak with training if they chose to. My parents did not choose to. My early years, I just accepted the way they were, and by the time I understood how different they were from other parents, it did not seem to matter. Still, somehow, I felt even that aspect of my birth was a cruel joke. Let's give the fool to parents who cannot speak or hear. At least I had an older brother, John, to help me acclimate to the strange, silent world my parents lived in. John, what a nice, strong name. Even my father's name, Frank, was a good, solid name. Was it another cruel joke that being born on the Day of Fools, I was named Leonidas? <laughs> to be saddled that with that all my life was a joke unto itself. I was always drawn to the dark side of life, although I'm not certain why. I don't think it had a thing to do with being born on April Fool's Day. It simply appealed to me and drew me in. I could see a tie-in had I been born on Halloween, but in the spring? Perhaps it was just my upbringing. Sometimes I think that being a part of my parents' silent world tended to shape me more than I'd have been born in a normal family. John and I were able to be as noisy as we wished with no repercussions, could complain about our parents without them hearing, could talk to each other late into the night with no one the wiser, but there was no doubt it was still a rather odd world in which to grow up. Even though John and I could hear and speak, most of the time we chose not to. We learned sign language and pantomime early, and that is how we communicated with our parents and with each other. But beyond that, I became very skilled at simply getting my point across just with my facial expressions. I guess that made me look more the fool to outsiders, but that was okay. By the time I reached adulthood, I knew just what the fool would do with his life. Although I'm not so sure I chose my life path, it may have chosen me. The first thing I would do was choose a variation on my given name, Leonidas. I needed something people could pronounce, not to mention spell. Once that was done, there was no looking back. Interestingly, although I'd be known by many names through my short 47 years of life, once I proved myself, I was never called the fool again, but given respect by the whole world. I think that even more than my chosen name of Lon, though, the nickname I liked most was the Man of a Thousand Faces. Yes, Leonidas Lon Chaney was nobody's fool. A lot of these are drawn from um, uh, truth. There is much, much truth in them. It's not all fiction, but it's fiction the way it comes out of my head. And lastly, I will read you a uh, one or two, whatever you wish, out of the historic murders of Wood County, Board, Wood, Wood County, Wisconsin, which was not chosen for the alliteration in there, but it does go fairly well. Um, I do have to apologize for the gum in my mouth. I take allergy medications and it makes my mouth very dry. This one is called Simply Senseless Murder. Grant Sherman Beardsley, 48, married less than 10 years, was father to five children when he was murdered in October 1912. Beardsley, named after two Union generals in the Civil War, Grant and Sherman, was in the habit of closing his grocery store and taking the money home, then putting up his horse for the night before heading into his house at 246th Street South. In the evening, on the evening of October 1st, when Beardsley arrived at his Grand Rapids home between 6 and 7 o'clock, Mortimer Andrus Wilson, born October 20, 1893, just 19 days short of his 19th birthday, was waiting for him with a kerchief on his face and a revolver in his hand. As Beardsley reached to hang up the bridle, Wilson came up behind him and demanded he raise his hands. Beardsley, thinking it was a joke, said, You're joshing, right? Wilson shot him in the back and ran. After walking to the house and alerting his wife, she summoned the sheriff. Beardsley was taken to the hospital for surgery, but not before giving a partial description of the man. Beardsley would not make it through the night. Although Beardsley did not recognize him after finding a knotted kerchief on the ground that a store owner identified as one being sold to Wilson the day before, the pieces of the puzzle came together, as Wilson had previously worked for Beardsley and knew his routine. Rather bizarrely, after the shooting, Wilson stopped at the Skinner store and the Witter Hotel barbershop for a shave, 
going on to Hasbrook livery and then eventually to a party at the Jaeger residence on Baker, where he was found playing cards. Taken in for questioning by Under Sheriff Welch of Grand Rapids, Wilson first denied the shooting and then confessed. He stated after his return from out west he needed money to marry. He also told two different versions of what had happened, saying first when Beardsley turned he bumped the gun and it discharged, and later saying he thought Beardsley was reaching for a gun in the buggy, so he shot him. A revolver with one chamber discharge was found in Wilson's suitcase. According to the Grand Rapids <coughs> newspaper, there was such anger in the city over the death of the beloved Beardsley that Wilson was transferred north to Wausau, Wisconsin for his safety. On October 3rd, he pleaded guilty in Stevens Point Circuit Court and was sentenced to life imprisonment at Waupon by Judge Park. He was also ordered to spend October 1st of each year in solitary confinement. Wilson showed no emotion receiving the sentence, but cried later and asked to visit his father in Grand Rapids before it being taken to a pond. In 1919, the Prison Reform Association tried to get Wilson pardoned by Governor Phillip because he had been a model prisoner and had tuberculosis. Phillip refused, mostly due to the outcry by once still outraged area residents. Finally, in August of 1923, after Grand Rapids paper mill owner George Meade became active in the fight, then Governor Blaine gave Wilson a conditional pardon with Meade as his custodian. In 1938, Wilson was given an absolute pardon by Governor La Follette. People who knew Beardsley said that he was a kind and caring man and had Wilson just asked for a loan, Beardsley would probably have helped him out. The whole affair was totally senseless. After his release, Mortimer Wilson married Elvira Strope, had three children, and lived free for another 44 years, one year longer than Margaret, than Margaret Rose Ham Beardsley, who raised her five children alone here in Wisconsin Rapids. Okay. Um, I'm going to call that enough since my mouth is getting drier by the moment. Yes. Um, your book, is that all the wood? Tony, or are there others? Oh, yeah, there are others. This is just the ones that I put in there. I tried to get a, a smattering from different places, and um, and at the time I wrote this, I have even since written more. In fact, I wrote two the other day again, two more murders. But um, so no, there probably are another 15, 20, 25, maybe even that are not in here. These are more or less the most. Um, the ones that you hear about more, that sort of thing. And uh, uh, there are names like the, uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of the Lord and Emery trial. It was a huge thing here. And there was another one that was, mm, David helped me out here, who was the man that uh, shot the, the judge that shot the banker? Well, anyway. Um, it was another big one, and it, was, it, it made national news all over. So, And there's another one in here that also made national news. And last year at Wakeley's Spirit Walk, they asked me to tell a story, and that was a story that I chose, and I did it in character. And it was about a little boy in Vesper who was murdered on Christmas by his father. That's very sad. And I told it from the viewpoint of the mother. And um, and that one made national headlines because it was called the Ghost Slayer Murder. The husband who killed the baby kept saying that his father's ghost was coming to him and telling him to kill the baby. And so across the United States, people took sides. A courtroom here was packed at the time. People took sides. You know, the spiritualists were all saying, "Oh no, that really is true." If he, if ghost, if he says a ghost told him, then a ghost told him. And the Christians were saying, "No way," you know. So um, I, I won't tell you the rest of it and how it goes, but that that one's in here. So there's more than one in here that made national news, uh, not just local news. So, any questions, please? Anybody? Anything? I um. I read an article a while back that you had published. It was in the in the Tribune. I think it was just an article you did, and it was about um, a dynamite accident on the beer and yes, yeah, by, yeah, by beer. yeah above beer mm -hmm. because they were dynamiting to, to break the ice loose. Mm -hmm. 
And I thought it was pretty interesting what was going on, and I realized that the man in it was my great grandmother's brother. Mm -hmm. And you know, she spoke of her family members, but she never talked about him too much. Mm -hmm. And it was just a horrible, horrible accident. Yes, and I, I actually have written several dynamite accident stories, uh, really bad ones, and I have written so many deaths to do with the Beering Mill. Way back in the days before OSHA and all that, you just there, there were no safety rules whatsoever, and horrible, horrible things happened up there. Um, those, of course, are not in here because these are strictly murders, but yes, I, uh, well, I'm glad you shared that. I, um, I would say probably once every couple months at least, someone will contact me and say, I read this or that story, and that was my great-grandfather or my whatever. I never knew he killed his wife, or I never knew that this or that. Back then, people didn't talk about such things, at least not in front of their children. And so many of the children, as they grew up, had no clue, because even as they were old enough that they could be told, the parents just didn't bother to talk about it anymore. So I am forever hearing that sort of thing. I do try to keep my stories back a hundred years or more if I can. Uh, especially if it's a murder story, because then the chances of uh, a living descendant, at least a child, uh, are slim. I have had it happen twice that people have contacted me and said that was my father, but neither case was a murder, it was about something else. Uh, and, the, and the people who contacted me were like, 97, and I'm going, wow. <laughs> um, but I, 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 I always, when people ask me why, what does it matter, the way I explain it is this. If I didn't know anything about my family history and somebody came to me and said, did you know that your grandfather was a serial killer? And you would just be like aghast. You're kidding. You know, no, I never knew that. Nobody ever said. But it would not impact you like if somebody came and said, did you know your dad was a serial killer? when maybe you thought your dad had died young or moved away or whatever, and then you find out, wow, I've seen stories on IDTV like that. No, don't want to be me. So I don't want to do that to anyone. I don't want anyone to go, wow, you know, that's what my dad did. Like I say, it's not as devastating if it's your grandparent or great uncle or something like that. So that's why I don't come too far forward. Trust me, there are some more recent ones I would love to be digging into. <laughs> Everybody always says, why don't you do Eleanor Roberts? We all know who. I said, yeah, I know, but no, I'm not touching that one. <laughs> so, any other questions? Yes? What kind of sources do you use for this? I was really interested in the, in the story of the family that moved out to Minnesota. She said, you must have used a lot of sources for that. I usually start, I usually find my stories uh, in the newspaper archives. And I would say, other than maybe, Ten where people have given me, you know, follow this or check this out. The rest I have found is I was researching another story, and there'll be a little thing here next to it that will say, so and so was arraigned in court today for the murder of, and I go, okay, that's another one I'll follow. And one leads to another, leads to another, and that's how it comes about. And then I use the newspaper archives and newspaper.com, which are both newspaper websites, but they carry different newspapers. And so you get a more complete look. And the other thing um, that I have uh, explained to people is that back during those days, a newspaper was not owned by a corporation as it is now. A man would just say, I'm going to start a newspaper. And he'd go downtown and get an office and set up a printing press and hire somebody to set type, and that was it. You were good to go. Very few, even larger cities, had, had like reporters or staff that they could send out because there were so many places to send them. Um, Oshkosh is absolute godsend because I swear they sent somebody out to check every story within a hundred miles radius of them. And so what happened when, you know, everything had to be word of mouth, of course. There was no teletype. It was somebody who had to go to Marshfield to pick up grain, then told them, did you know in Wisconsin Rapids this man killed somebody? And the Marshfield newspaper owner, the editor, says, oh good, and he hops in his buggy and he comes down here. Now, the police are only as good as the information that they can garner from whatever their sources are, and let's face it, that was the days before CSI and all that sort of thing. And they would go out, let's just say that, uh, pick one of my stories and here it doesn't matter, uh, a guy kills his girlfriend. 
And they would go out and they would say to the neighbors, what did you hear? What did you see? Well, some of them maybe saw something, some of them didn't. But that was all that they could really do. The sheriff would just ask around and, okay, that was it. And they'd make their determination. And that was one of the reasons that so many people walked free back then. Because they really couldn't prove anything unless there were eyewitnesses right there. And that didn't happen often. And for some reason, they did not seem to take the word of children. <coughs> even, even children that were like... Um, any age, it didn't matter. Teenagers didn't matter. They did not take their word for it, even though they could give accurate descriptions of everything that, no, no, if it wasn't an adult there, they did not want to listen to it. So, okay, so now this murder has taken place, let's say, in Nakusa. And the sheriff comes out and talks to whoever he can. And then the reporter from Marshville comes down and talks to somebody. And the, rep and the I shouldn't say reporter, the editor from Rapids comes out and talks to somebody. And the one from Stevens Point comes over, and the one from Oshkosh comes. Now you have all these people, maybe days apart, talking to different people. More information is being put together this whole time because the neighbors are talking. Well, I've been seeing this other man come over there. Okay, so you get more information, more, more sources. Um, and so I can sit down with all of these newspaper articles, and now I have a clear picture. It's like I have gone out and interviewed many, many more people than the police ever did. So now I can see, okay, well this happened and here's the timeline and now this happened and this one says this and this one says that. And now you have it all. You have the whole picture. So then you can write the story. Um, once in a while, well, when I'm done with that, when I've gathered all my facts from the newspapers, then I use all my genealogy sources and I go in and I find... <coughs> stuff about the family. When did they come here? When did they settle in Wisconsin? Uh, when did they show up on the uh, census records? Um, where did they live? That's where I get addresses many times is off the census where they lived. Uh, and you look at this one and these children were here then and they're gone on this one. Okay, you know. So you, 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 you put all that together. And you know who their parents were and why they immigrated here or whatever the, the case is. And so now I can flesh out the story. And that kind of is what happened with the Ensign story. Once I had his name, I could track where the family had settled. I knew just what part of Saratoga settlement they lived in. I knew that he had the sawmill. I, I could, uh, you get, you look at deeds, abstracts, plat maps, all that stuff. I use all of that and then put together the full picture. And then if you're lucky enough to realize, okay, now I'm following the Ensign family. Where did they go? Where did they go? And you find out, oh, they're in, a min in Minnesota. And then all of a sudden, you can Google the name and it comes up in these books. And it's like, well, these are the children's names from, you know, the, the George Ensign's children. And here they are in the little house in the prairie. You know, so you put it together. So, for instance, I think I'm the only person in history that ever put that together, that the man who lived here and his little boy died here, they ended up being friends with the Ingalls family. And so, is it earth-shaking? Does it matter to anybody about anything? No, but it's just really cool to know. And that's what I love about history. And the other thing is, I tell, I, here's a question for you. Now, be honest. I'm not going to ask you any questions. I'm just going to ask you this one, so you will not have to answer another one. Do any of you here have anything that has happened in your life whether it's you personally or your immediate family, do you have anything that happened in your life that you think would make a really good story? And I'm not saying murder story. I'm just saying a really good story. Come on. Let's see hands. I know you do. I know you do, David, because I know your relatives. Yes. And you do. See? See? Come on back there. Anybody on that side? Yeah, see? See? More people are admitting now. And if you, if, you, if you think about it enough, we all have something that's pretty unique to us. Now, would it make a bestseller? You know, maybe not. But it still would make a very interesting story. My father was the ultimate storyteller. I have family here who can attest to that. And he could, he could weave a tale and tell a story. And he owned a, a service station out on Highway 73 towards Nakusa. And he would sit out there and do what I called hold court. Because in the evening when his service station work was done, his garage work, people walked out there. From the time I was a kid in the 50s, right up until 
Practically he died. People came and surrounded him and wanted to hear his stories. And he was born and raised in Pennsylvania, so many of them were exploits that he had at that time and that sort of thing. But it didn't matter. It could have been ha something that happened three days before with one of the neighbors down the road. He made it, he could make the most mundane thing into the, just the most fabulous, fabulous story. And I think I got his storytelling ability, maybe not off the cuff and maybe not as humorous, but I think I got some of it. But it always fascinated me how he could tell these stories. And even if it was the third, fourth, fifth time, they still laughed and they still were enthralled. Every single word. And it's like, wow, you know. And then in, in high school, if you'll allow me one more little thing here. In high school, um, one of my English teachers wanted each of us to bring in a short story that we had read and read it in front of the class. And now, of course, 90% of the class goes, oh. and I'm going, yes, <laughs> yeah. I'll read everybody else's fine with me. And so, but it wasn't anything we wrote. It was just a story that we really liked. And my all-time favorite short story is Ray Bradbury's story called The October Game. Anybody here know it? Uh, yeah, <laughs> my daughter. Um, go home. It's on. It's online. Go home if you like things a little bit dark. Go home and just Ray Bradbury, The October Game, and read it. Doesn't take long. So I took that into class to read when it was my turn, and I fancied myself from the time I was child, uh, a child. Uh, I thought I was going to be a writer, really famous writer. You know, like, I mean, make millions and millions of dollars writer. Uh -huh. <laughs> and um, I will say, Dean Koontz, the horror writer, and I share the same third great grandfather. So maybe there's a little <laughs> bit of something comes down there genetically. Maybe that's where my dad got it from, too. I don't know. Um, but I, even as a child, <laughs> when my mother went in, for my first grade, and first grade, you I, way back when, because I'm 70 now. So in first grade, I was four and a half years old, and she went in for my first parent-teacher conference. And Mrs. Mayer said, um, I, I want to, well, I guess it was the end of the year. She says, I want to skip her to third grade. And my mom said, no, absolutely not. She started school at four and a half, and we're not going to skip her. She's already younger than all the other students. No, she's going to. But my mom said, well, why? And they, the teacher said, well, she's just advanced. And my mom said, well, how and what way? And she said, well, for instance, her writing. Now, now, how much do you write in first grade? How much do you know? You're barely reading Run, Jane, Run, you know. And the teacher said, well, for instance, I will tell the children, I want you to write one sentence using the word cat. And she said, the kids all write their sentence and turn their paper in. She said, and half an hour later, there's Rhonda. She's on her third sheet of paper, writing still about the cat. She just wants to write. She has to write. So, And it is true about writers. There's something within you. It's like air. You've got to do it. You can't not do it. And I know that's a double negative, but you can't not do it. Anyway, so I went in and uh, still thinking someday I'll be a famous writer. And I read... Ray Bradbury's The October Game. And by the time I read it for class, I had read it so many times through the years, I practically had it memorized. And so I could read it, but I could really watch the faces out there. And of course, the, the boys are sitting there like this, oh, another one, you know, and the girls are going ho-hum just about as bad. <coughs> but it drew you in. It's the kind of story that, oh, wait a minute, now, now what's going to happen? Oh, wait, no, maybe this is going to be pretty interesting. And so, one by one, they would set up a little bit straighter in their desks, and they started paying attention to me, and I'm thinking, I like this, <laughs> you know. And I got to the end of it, and I will not tell you what the story is about or anything else to give it away, but I got to the very end of it, and the very last line is the punchline to the entire story. Now, if you go home and read it, do not read that last line until you read the rest of it. <laughs> And I knew just where to put my pauses. And I got done, and so there was this long pause, and everybody is just waiting with baby breath, like, come on, come on, what's going to happen next? And then I delivered the last line. And dear Sharon Nessa fainted. <laughs> and several of the girls went, <coughs> and the guy, I mean, there were gasps from the, from the guys and everything. And I thought to myself, 
this is it. This is the power of the word, whether it's spoken or written. Words have such power. And I thought, that's what I want. I want to write things that when people read it, they will go, wow. You know, so that's kind of kind of what I've tried to do with all three of these, but certainly the last two. So, Anyway, any other questions? Yes? In your one about the murders, Wicked, Wicked Wood County? Yes. So after you had all the newspapers and you look at all the different uh, research on it, uh -huh. but of course it's 100 years later, the verdict is, sentence is done. Yes. Did you normally agree with them or did you find many let go that shouldn't have been and there, yes. all of that? Yes, there were, there were several times and I am not above in all of my columns. <coughs> and I thought that they let the wrong man go or whatever. There was one of them I read the other day at one of the readings and I just said his wife had been committed to a, a mental institution but he murdered this young girl. It's in the Wickedwood County book. And I end it by saying I think they sent the wrong one to the crazy house because he obviously was crazy. Yes, I, I always say um, there are a couple that were never proven anything. The person was let go and I say uh-uh, they did it. <laughs> What's going to happen? They're going to come back from the dead and, you know. Uh, I, so, yes, I'm very, um, I would say most of the time I do agree, but there are times, especially the ones that never got solved or that they did nothing, it's like, how blind could you be? Some of them, the person all but, you know, admits it, and they, and they know, and they still did nothing, you know. So, yes, very much so. Um, and, and it's another reason that I was able to take one of the stories in the Saratoga Sands book, um, which has since been rewritten in a much better form. It's about um, my great aunt who supposedly committed suicide when she, just after she got married, she was 19 years old, and she supposedly committed suicide, <coughs> which all the family believed all our lives and then when I started to write the story and got other newspaper sources in there one newspaper in Racine which is a city she was from published something her younger brother had said and her younger brother was there at the time that she died from the gunshot wound and at the just before I wrote this one of his relatives contacted me and told me something he had said at age 97 or something in the nursing home and it was like boom that's it it's put together now I know because of the newspaper and what he said but mostly because of the newspaper proved that she did not kill herself he accidentally shot her she was trying to take the gun away from him he shot her and when even though she was conscious for a little while at the hospital she took the blame for it because it was her little brother and she did not want to see anything happen to him so it's it's really cool what you can put together when you have all the information. Yes, back there. Where would an easy place? To, where would there be an easy place to get your books? Besides, in a store? oh oh, there there currently is no store that they are in. Um, I am selling them at the signings and readings. Um, there probably uh, will be some. I'm, I can't say for sure, but I'm going to guess there'll be a. a few copies at Whetstone's Antiques after I do the signing there. I know uh, he kept some of my Saratoga book before, so I'm thinking he'll keep some around to sell. Um, and my Saratoga book was also sold by Mike Kittner over at the health food store, but I haven't approached him about this one yet. I'm sure he'll have me do a signing out at uh, Wakely uh, Pioneer Fest that they do in June. I'd like to go out there for that, and then he probably will put them in the store there too at that time. But that's it. Um, originally, when Wickedwood County came about, the, the way that happened, I had no plans of doing this, and I was contacted by the largest historic publisher in the United States, which is called, um, mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm, the History Press, and is part of Arcadia Publishing. And they contacted and said, uh, they wanted me to do a book. They ran across me. And uh, the acquisitions editor said, would you write this book? And originally it was supposed to be Portage County because that's a bigger market. And then um, I decided, they decided to go with Wood County because I had more places, more venues for readings and signings. But it was ridiculous because I was going to be paid a small commission. The only benefit, he said, well, the benefit is it's, it will be in Barnes and Nobles. 
And I said, yes, but it'll only be in central Wisconsin, Barnes and Nobles. You know, you, you wouldn't even find this in one in, in various parts of Wisconsin because who cares about Wood County, you know. And it's, if I were doing a book of fiction that was going, and they said, and we'll put it in Barnes and Nobles all over the United States, I would have went, yes. But, it, but that's not the case. So then I thought, why don't I do it myself? And when I told him that, he said, that's a smart move. <laughs> so that's what I did. I already had them all pulled together, so why not publish? Anything else? And you do, if you don't want to buy a book tonight, if you want to pick up my card or just take one with you, take a card with you, so that you have it. That way you can always send me an email. I have shipped out I don't know how many by mail. I'm always going to the post office and mailing out more and more and more, so I can always mail one too. Yes? When you talked about um, the, the crimes becoming a little more bizarre as mm -hmm. they as you move south, um, were these perpetrators then of these more bizarre crimes? It seems to me, uh, if I don't know if it was at the time when you were when these incidences occurred, but in in that more southern part of the state, um, aren't there more? Um, residents who are who have come in from other areas and did you find that the perpetrators were tended to be more than like like native sons like like that had committed the crimes further north that there was more you know coming in from other areas or, or no correlation at all no not really um there was some of each it didn't seem to make much difference there was one horrific one that's in the book called Murder Most Foul. Um, they were uh, Polish, Russian Jews that came up from Chicago. Chicago. And, and evidently there was a whole community of them right out about where the branding iron is, out by Smoky Joe's Corner. And, uh, you know, so, so sometimes it would be within a certain group who was just here a short period of time and they didn't really stay around. But other times it was Native Sons, it was the first settlers, it was the just a mix of everything, everything. Just, just more bizarre things seemed to happen way back in the earliest days in Saratoga, and yet Saratoga wasn't the earliest area settled in the county. So, and those crimes uh, were did not tend to have more of a connection, say, with organized crime. Than oh no, 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 there wasn't. There wasn't that. I have written a couple things kind of on that order, but they are not in the book. Yeah. Book. Back there, somebody had a question? Oh, yes. Is this your newest Saratoga? No. This is the original one that I did. Okay. And I had been telling people for years that wanted it that I'm down to the last copies and I will not reprint. But the book signings, it just so many people are buying that that I thought, well, okay, maybe I better. It does need like I say, an, a good edit job on it. But So maybe I will republish just because it's it, it, more people are aware of it now and interested in it. I have the original one. All right. All right. Yes? Who do you publish through? I just self publish through lulu.com online. Okay. And uh, there are so many self publishers out there, but I. The first time I worked with them, it was with much trepidation because there was a lot of negative online about them. And I thought, okay, I'll take my chances. And I just ordered a real small order of the Saratoga book and everything came through just fine. And I thought, well, okay. So each time I've ordered from them with every book and every subsequent order, I've done probably a total of eight, nine orders total. And everything has always been fine. And, and they're quick and uh, very reasonably priced. They do uh, prefer that you use their services because then they can charge you a lot more, and I don't do that. I have it ready to go, and I just send it off to them. And my covers, fortunately, I have a daughter who's an extremely wonderful graphic artist, and all I have to do is tell her, okay, well, I'm picturing these, these pages falling off of a calendar, and on the back of it I need this crack like the book is wooden with a with a, a, a bookmark in there that says, um, be careful what you wish for. And I went and she'll say, Mom, just let me do it. Just let me do it. Okay. And, and the same with this one. I just gave her a general idea. And this is a collage of family photos and whatever, Saratoga photos. But So she just whips them out for me. And then, so she sends me the cover-ready art. 
which is something that I don't think most of us would be able to do. You'd have to either have a designer do it or have Lulu do it, but in my case it was, or have a plain cover, I guess. It wouldn't matter. But but I, uh, I wasn't too excited with them at first when I started, but I have not had a problem, so. Yeah. Anyone else? What do you mean use their services? Like what? Pardon? What do you mean by use their services? The publisher. Oh, they offer editing. They offer um, uh, layout. They offer uh, uh, designing, design, the designing the cover, doing everything. They'll even do your, you name it, your forward, your, you know, your indexing, your whatever. I indexed Saratoga Sands. I did not these other two because I was pushing to get them out before Christmas this year. Um, so I do apologize for that. And with this one, it didn't have to be, but this one, it would have been nice. Probably before I publish this one again, the murder one, I will index it so that people who want can just pick it up. I was noticing in one I read today, um, the woman's maiden name was Ham, and I thought, wow, I deal with you know Margaret Ham and, and her son so often, and I bet that's part of the family, and I never even thought about pointing out, did you know? But I think they have this last book anyway, so. Any other questions? No? Well, thank you for being such a, a good audience, and most of you stayed awake. I thank you for that. <laughs> and uh, just more than anything, just thank you for coming. And if anybody doesn't want to buy a book tonight, or don't, you know, whatever things, maybe someday you do, grab a business card, and that's fine too. However you'd like to do it. Don't take credit cards, sorry, but I do take checks and uh, and cash, good old-fashioned cash. Mm -hmm. so.